Cole Nussbaumer Naflick. Cole tells stories with data. She's the CEO of Storytelling with Data and author of the best selling book, Storytelling with Data a data visualization guide for business professionals, which I've seen her signing multiple copies of already. And this is, book has been translated into a dozen languages, used as a textbook by more than 100 universities, and serves as the course book for the tens of thousands of Storytelling with Data workshop participants. For nearly a decade, Cole and her team have delivered interactive learning sessions highly sought after by data-minded individuals companies, and philanthropic organizations all over the world. They also help people create graphs that make sense and weave them into compelling stories through the popular Storytelling with Data blog, podcast, and monthly hashtag SWD challenge. With no further ado, Cole Nussbaumer Naflick. So I am so excited for today. Uh, about a week ago, the CEO came to me, well, came to my manager, and said, we need to do some data to uh, figure out if we're focusing our marketing efforts in the right places. So I have spent the last week of my life pulling together the most beautiful dashboard. Right? This was not a small feat. I had to gather data from disparate sources, try to put it together in a way that makes sense, clean it, aggregate it, and then, of course, build the dashboard. Right? So I've done what I think is an amazing job. I've actually not slept for the last couple of days. And I've applied like every data visualization best practice there is. I'm about to go into the meeting to present it to the CEO. Ta-da! Wait, what? No, you just, you go to this drop down and you deselect, no? You want more data? Next week, yeah, uh, I'll be back, okay, thank you. So that didn't go as planned. How is it that I can spend a week of my life and energy putting together something that I think is fantastic that so clearly doesn't meet my audience's needs? Oh well, back to the drawing board. So I'm at home after work that afternoon, and I'm still struggling with this idea, right? Struggling that I can spend time and effort and have it apparently be misdirected and not meet the need. But I don't have too much time to reflect on this, because soon my kids get home from school. And my six-year-old, he's our oldest, Avery, says, I need help with my homework. So I sit down to help Avery with his homework, but as soon as I do, the other two descend upon us and are fighting for my attention. So I'm trying to figure out how can I wrangle the madness that is now my dining room table and turn it into something productive so that we can help Avery with his homework. So I have an idea. Let's go to the costume bin, right? Kids, everybody dress up like your favorite superhero, your favorite character. And we're going to each have powers. We're going to combine those powers in a way that we can help Avery with his homework. So a few minutes later, kids start filing back, adorned in various fashions. So Avery has chosen a random assortment of things. He has his BB-8 helmet, safety goggles. You can't see it in the picture, but he's actually also wearing knee pads, uh, and then a cape. Eloise has gone a little more simple. She's a cat. And then Dorian decided to resurrect his recent Halloween costume and has shown up as a blue ninja. All right, together we're going to have powers. We're going to help Avery with his homework. Avery's homework looks like this. Have you seen a piece of paper that looks like this before? How many people, is this nostalgic? Yeah, for me, I'm brought right back to the first grade, right? We're writing stories, and it's sort of brilliant if you think about it, right? Because there's space for pictures, there's space for the words, and so Avery, that's what his assignment is. He's meant to write and illustrate a short story. So by the time we all gather, he's already given it a start, and his short story, beginning of it, looks like this. And so Eloise, before I can even get a word out of my mouth, is immediately at his side. And she's asking questions. And so she starts off, what is this? Avery says, well, the dog is happy, the cat is sad. And then Eloise proceeds to ask again and again and again. Eloise is three, by the way. And she has one question that she asks more frequently than any other, several dozen times a day. 
What is that question that Eloise asks? Why? And so Avery says, the dog is happy, the cat is sad. Eloise, why? Well, the cat's sick. Why? And I observe them going through this Q&A process and am realizing that as they do, she's teasing information out of him, right? There are these connections that for him are already there. They're already in his head. But it actually takes someone else asking that question of why for him to put that out in the world in a way that makes sense to someone else. And then Dorian joins in the fun, and Dorian says, yeah, but what's the story? Because Dorian is five. He's been starting to read. And one of the things that he's noticed is in his favorite books, they all tend to follow a similar pattern. They start off, there's a sense of place, right, a setting, and then there are characters, and almost always something goes wrong. But then usually by the end of the story, that thing that went wrong got better somehow. And so when he's asking Avery what's the story, he's craving that pattern, right? Wanted to figure out what's the tension and how did it get resolved? So the three of them go through this uh, quite cooperatively, asking questions, raising ideas. Avery's drawing and writing and redrawing and erasing and trying out different things. At the end of the better part of an hour, he ends up with this. The dog is happy, the cat is hungry. <laughs> it's not done. The dog tricks the cat, gives her dog food. The cat eats it, she gets sick. Right? Lovely illustration here demonstrating that. Uh, the dog says, I thought it would be funny. I didn't know you'd get sick. I'm sorry. They're friends again. <laughs> so clearly he has a future as an author illustrator, right? Uh, so success though, right? Kids have combined. They've used some different superpowers to help Avery with his homework. So it's actually only later that evening, kids are in bed, there's quiet in the house again, where I'm able to reflect on this process. And I recognize that the lessons that these super kids use to help Avery with his homework, I might actually be able to make use of them when it comes to my data communication. So if I step back and think about the roles that they played, the characters, the lessons we can learn, Avery was super writer. Right? He recognized that words can help us improve our pictures, and as we refine our pictures, we can use better words in this sort of recursive manner where both improve and get stronger. He also taught the importance of sketching, right? of using a very important tool that we almost always overlook, paper. Right? Because with paper, you can try things out. You can try things out quickly, and you can recycle the stuff that you don't like. At one point, Avery had four different cats drawn out, all with tails going in different directions. But that enabled him to see it so that he could then pick the one that worked for him. We can do that similar sort of iterating with the pictures we draw with our data as well. Sure, you can do it in your tool, but when you start low tech, you form less attachment, it's easier to move quickly from one idea to the next, you can erase, you can start over without it feeling like you've invested a ton in a way that can be super useful. Eloise was a curious cat. Her simple question of why, over and over and over again, helped Avery from stopping at the basics and going deeper than that. And with our data, we always want to do that, right? Because if we stop at the cursory overview, we run the risk of missing important parts of what's going on. When we ask ourselves and those around us the simple question of why multiple times, we're forced to build a more robust understanding of our data. And when we do that, we can help drive smarter actions based on that data. And finally, Dorian was our narrative ninja. Right? He recognized that stories have structure. They have shape. And we can use this with fantastic advantage when it comes to our data and the messages we want to communicate with it and the actions we want to drive. We can actually use the structure of story to get our audience's attention and build credibility and motivate them to act. Let's take a look at how I might apply these superpowers to my data. Start off with our super writer. So picture power is this interesting concept where when you're starting to read or you're writing, you look at the picture to get a sense of what's going on, and then you read the words. And as you read the words, if you get stuck at any point, you can look to the picture for clues of how to get there, right? When it's like sounding out words and those sorts of things. 
we can use this same sort of picture power with our data, right? Look at a picture of our data, start forming words around that. And as we do that, we can recursively improve both the picture and the words. Let's take a look at how we might do that with one of the graphs from my dashboard. So here, we're looking at store traffic. This is millions of customers coming into our stores over the course of time, starting at September 2017 at the left, going through September 2019 at the right. So I can just start forming some words about this graph, making some observations. So in looking at this data, I might note that there's some variance, but if we look just at September's over time, traffic has gone down and is at a three-year low. Or maybe it's interesting that January tends to be our strongest month in terms of number of customers visiting our stores. If I point that out, perhaps I'm apt to note that April and July also seem to have higher traffic. And it's when I do that that I start to see the peaks and valleys in this data, and maybe recognize that they look consistent year over year. So there's maybe some seasonality at play here. So now that I've made some observations about my graph, I might pull them together into a single sentence that en encompasses the message I want to get across. So in this case, that sentence could be something like, store traffic has decreased over time and there appears to be seasonality. So now that I've improved my words, I can think about how I might formulate a picture that perhaps better illustrates those words. That's when I turn back to my low tech tool and get myself some paper. And so I can start sketching, right? For example, I might focus on the fact that we saw the September decrease over time. Said some words over time there that make me think of lines, so maybe I try plotting this as a line graph. But here I've taken away so much that I lose the seasonality part of this data. So maybe I'll add all my data points back in, but maintain it as a line that looks like this. And now, if I stare at this, I can sort of try to figure out that the peaks and valleys are consistent year over year, but wouldn't it be a lot nicer if those were overlaid so we could see it for sure and didn't have to do that work? To do that, I might choose an x-axis that runs the course of the calendar year, January to December, and then make 2018 and 2019 each their own lines. If I step back and think about what I can use that to see, I can see now that that seasonality does appear to be consistent year over year. I can also see there's a gap where 2019 has been falling consistently below 2018. If I want to draw attention to that, maybe I'll even plot another graph there where I can actually show the absolute difference or the percent difference year over year. So I've used my words to refine different visuals that might illustrate those words. Now that I've landed on a visual I like, I can go back and refine my words. So I'm using this visual, I might change my words to something like, we've had a decrease in store traffic year over year, and that gap has grown larger in recent months. All right, so traffic's going down. Then I get Eloise in my ear asking, why? So to answer that question, let's take a look at another graph from my dashboard and do the same process over again. This sort of repetition builds good habits. So here we're looking at year-over-year -year change in uh, traffic by region. And so, again, I might start forming pictures, or excuse me, uh, words, sentences about this data. Maybe it's interesting that we're down everywhere, right? This is negative year-over-year -year change. So we're negative everywhere, so we're down everywhere. I realize as I explain this, this might be a confusing way to show this data, which I'll revisit when we start drawing it momentarily. You might notice that traffic was down less, right? It's less negative in the first part of the year, has been down more, it's more negative in the more recent months. Or on a regional basis, maybe it's interesting that the Northeast has been the lowest and consistently quite a lot lower in the last few months. So now that I've used my graph to draw some, to say some words, right, in this case I might summarize by traffic's down everywhere, especially in the Northeast. Now I can start drawing those things. So maybe I'll start with a table, right? As we talked about that, year over year change was confusing. So I might instead choose to plot our absolute values of traffic by region. That's what the table does here. So we have 2018 versus 2019, we're focusing just on September and what that breakdown looked like across regions. Now, tables are interesting because they seem really simple, but they're actually quite hard when it comes to how we process them. 
When I'm faced with a table, I'm scanning and I'm reading and I'm trying to mentally hold on to big numbers and little numbers so I can mentally compare them to other big numbers and little numbers. A highly taxing cognitive process. Anything we can do to make that data visual is going to make it more quickly accessible. Let's take a few views of this data. Maybe I'll start with bar chart. Okay, so here we still have September 2018 on the left, 2019 on the right, and now I can see the region breakdown within that. Now, anytime we're showing data, we want to be thoughtful about what do we want our audience to do with our data, right? What do we want to allow them to compare? If we can identify things we want our audience to compare, we want to try to align those things to a common baseline and put them as physically as close as possible together. So one of the reasons that bar charts are so common is because they do both of those things for us. Here, if I think about what's easiest to compare, I can focus on September 2019, for example. And then within that, it's easy to compare the regions because they're next to each other. It's a more difficult comparison. I can still do it because of the colors here. If I wanted to compare the Northeast across time points, for example, because there I have to go and I have to try to find the blue bar in the first graph, side of it, the blue bar in the second graph, and now I'm comparing things that are farther apart. So if that is a more important comparison, I can think about switching how I categorize that data and actually show pairwise bars, where now my primary category is region, and then within that we see 2018 versus 2019. Now, when we're faced with pairwise bars like this, the primary comparison our eyes are making of the endpoints of the bars relative to each other. So we could actually draw some lines on that graph. And when we do that, we don't really need the bars anymore. So we can think about collapsing those lines into what's known as a slope graph, which is really just a fancy word for a line graph that only has two points in it. Here, what this allows us to do is just see that things have decreased everywhere and more in the Northeast than elsewhere, which seems like a good picture for getting across my sentence here. Okay, so we have traffic is down. Traffic's down everywhere, especially in the Northeast. So I get a Louise in my head again asking me, but why? So we actually can do this process for every bit of data in our dashboard, and then some if we need to, right? If I think about going through this dashboard and writing a sentence about each, we've looked at a couple of these already, right? Store traffic overall. We've had a decrease year over year. The gap has widened recently. We saw that it's down across all regions. Ah, here's something new, though, because here is where we encounter for the first time our super shoppers. So these, it turns out, are our most important customer segment. And traffic is down with them, too. And when it comes to sales, so sales is made up of a couple components. There's traffic, right, the number of people who come into our stores. But there's also basket. What do they actually buy when they get to our stores in terms of items and price of items? And that's what the final graph here is attempting to show us. So we're going to write a sentence there. It could be something like, well, there's some noise. But over time, if we compare just September's, Basket and the basket components haven't really changed over time. All right, then jumps Dorian in and says, but what's the story? All right, so we've outlined some takeaways. We've got some data, some pictures to be able to use as evidence of those takeaways. So here I want to think back to that paper that Avery started with. And when it comes to our data stories, we want to have analyzed the data well enough so that we know what's going on. Um, but when we come to plotting our story or the path we're going to take our audience through, we actually set the data aside and focus more on, you know, what are the words? How do we connect them? How do we connect those pieces? And my story is going to be a little more nuanced than the cat got sick. So I'm going to shrink this down, add some more pieces there. And when I do this, I'm reminded of another of my favorite low-tech planning techniques, storyboarding. Quick show of hands, how many people know what storyboarding is? You know what I mean when I say those words. Keep your hands up for a minute. How many people storyboard on a regular basis? Oh my goodness, like almost every hand went down. Some hands stay up, which is awesome. Congratulations, good job. So storyboarding is creating a visual outline of your content before you actually create any content. Now, it's a step in the process that used to have to happen because getting graphs into a dashboard or information onto a slide took such tools, such experts, that we had to get it right on paper first. That is no longer the case. 
Right, today, anyone can go to their tool and start making graphs and building dashboards and creating slides. And we can end up with a massive dashboard or slide deck that actually doesn't get our point across effectively. So if that's a pattern that sounds familiar, storyboarding is a strategy you can use to break out of that pattern, which is before you turn to your tools, again, start low tech. Pens, paper, some of my favorite tools for storyboarding, itty bitty post-it notes. They are small, which forces me to be concise with my ideas. They lend themselves to being easily rearranged so I can explore different narrative flows. There is also something very interesting that happens when we do work in our machines that causes us to form attachment to what we've done. Sometimes to the extent that even if we know it could be better or should be changed, we resist doing so because of the time it's taken for us to get it where it is. Right, if I have just spent five hours creating the most beautiful graph on the most beautiful dashboard, and we're going through it together, and we get to this particular graph, and you tell me, hey, I don't actually think we need that one. Can we just scrap that? That feels bad. Right? There are feelings of loss associated with that. There is real loss associated with that when we consider the five hours of work it took me to make the beautiful graph in the beautiful dashboard. Whereas if we're planning with our sticky notes and we get to one, we say, eh, let's recycle it, there's not that same feeling of loss involved. There's also not the five hours of lost work involved. So two points here. One is to storyboard. Secondly is to do so in a low tech fashion, pen, paper, post-it notes. And when I storyboard, which I do, by the way, any time I'm going to be going through anything, basically, it's one of those things that feels uh, awkward when you first start doing it, but after doing it a few times, you build a habit, and now I almost can't not do it because it feels like I've skipped a step. But I tend to break my storyboarding into three distinct phases. Brainstorming, editing, and getting feedback and iterating with that feedback. So let's take a look at how we might do that with my data story here. So let's start by brainstorming. Let's get myself a sticky note, and I can let this just be a cathartic process, where I let the ideas out of my head, get them into the physical world, written down on paper. Um, because when I do that, it'll allow me to do some interesting things when we get a little further into the process. And as I'm doing this, I don't have to give any thought to you know, whether the thing ends up in my dashboard or in my deck or what order it goes in. I can just let the ideas flow. So if I start doing this with my scenario, right, the sort of basic plot line here is sales are down. That's what's driving us to look into this in the first place. All right, let's set that to the side. Okay, what next? Um, ah, the question that the CEO came to us with is how should we focus our marketing efforts? So we talked about this a little bit, but sales is made up on the one hand of traffic, how many people come into our stores, and on the other hand, basket. What do they actually buy in terms of number and price when they get there? So we looked at all of these things. If we think about our process, you know, maybe there's some interesting notes about the data or the methodology, uh, what we did. And then I can start maybe outlining some of our findings, right? What did we learn when we analyzed the data? There was the seasonality, uh, January, and actually I can use this to pull in some other context. January is higher, but we know why. January is when we run our annual sale. So it brings a lot more people into our stores. And actually it turns out there's context behind the April and July increases as well. April we run some mini sales. July is important. July is when we run our super shopper promotions. Brings a ton of our super shoppers, that most important customer segment, into our stores. So total traffic's down. As we saw, it's down across all regions. And in the Northeast, where it was down the most, we actually closed a couple of stores, so that's not so surprising. Right, so I can start putting in notes on the context that I know that will come into play in some, with some of this data as well. Traffic is down more for our super shoppers, it turns out, and that super shopper decreases also across all regions. Basket, if we look at what people have been buying in our stores in terms of average number, average cost, has remained roughly stable over time. It's been a little bit of change where if we consider the components, average number of items, average price per item, the average number of items is down a little bit, but the average price per item is up a little bit. So those things end up evening out. 
So basket doesn't seem to be the issue here, right, when you think about the lever that we need to control uh, in impact on sales. Rather, the decrease in store traffic seems to be the trend that we want to focus on reversing. So if that's the case, then my recommendation might be let's focus marketing on getting more people into the stores. All right, so I brainstorm. I've gotten all the ideas out of my head into the physical world. And it usually doesn't take very long to do this, right? Spend five minutes writing down ideas. Then once you do that, it's time to step back and think about what organizational structure might I put around these to help make them make sense to someone else. So let's start doing that. I'm gonna start adding some super categories and rearranging things as part of my editing process. So maybe we'll start off with a question, right? How should we focus? Uh, if I look at the next bunch of stickies, they're all around the sort of data and the analysis, so maybe we'll group those there. It's a whole bunch of stickies that help outline the findings, what we learned through our analysis of the data, so let's group those there. Uh, then we have a recommendation. I just pull a couple of these over there. Notice now I've got some, some that haven't been categorized, right, that are sort of left out on their own. So one of the interesting things that happens when we storyboard in a low-tech manner like this is it means I have to actually consider each of these ideas and decide whether they are critical to my story. And in some cases, I will decide that they are not, which means you should always have a discard pile where you can start pulling stuff out that you don't need. And I'll find sometimes I'll write down the same idea five or 10 times and discard it five or 10 times. So it might be interesting or relevant, but not every bit of interesting or relevant thing needs to be in our final communication. So one huge benefit you get from storyboarding up front is more targeted communications when you go through the rest of the effort. So let's clean things up a little here, shift over, get rid of my discard pile. And now I have something that I could think about showing to someone else. So I'm actually gonna take this to my manager, sit down with them and say, here is the path I'm thinking of. What do you think? And the sooner into a process you can get that sort of feedback from a client, a stakeholder, the better, right? Because if I can say to my manager, hey, this is rough, but here's what I'm thinking, and can either get the feedback that says, yes, this is perfect, execute, or no, actually, let's go in this other direction, now I've not spent the time to create an entire dashboard or deck to get that feedback. So I sit down with my manager, and we go through this. My manager says a couple of really important things to me when it comes to feedback. First, my manager says, all right, total basket didn't change, but what about basket for super shoppers? Did you look at that? Oh, no, missed that. Let's take a note down, let's see what the basket's looking like for our super shoppers. My manager also says to me, don't just go in blindly saying we should market or focus our marketing on getting more people into stores. Go talk to someone with mar in marketing. See what their plans are. They may also have other context around some of the data that you're seeing that will help you paint a more robust picture. All right, go talk to some people in marketing. Got it. So I do both of those things. I look into the data, I talk to marketing, and it changes some things for me. Specifically, uh, basket overall was stable, but when I take a look at that for our super shoppers, their basket has changed, it's decreased. And when we look at the details behind that, super shoppers are buying fewer, but more expensive items. It's actually gonna completely change my recommendation now in light of this new data that I would have missed if my manager hadn't asked me why. So let's scrap what we have there. So I also talked to someone in marketing and I learned some good things there as well. First off is they already have some plans to pilot things that they think are going to increase store traffic. All right, so my recommendation changes from, hey, go do this thing, to let's support this thing that they're already planning. And I also get some insight from marketing about some luxury partnerships that we've formed this year that we've used to create promotions for our super shoppers. And they've been wildly successful, which is why I'm seeing some of what I'm seeing in the data. So in light of all of that, now my recommendation can be, well, let's support what marketing's already planning, and let's think about doing more with these luxury brands and super shoppers, see if we can turn this negative trend we've been seeing in sales and traffic around. So now I've iterated based on the feedback that my manager has given me, so I now have a pretty nice structure. 
but it's still not a story. Right? Because I get Dorian back in my head saying, but what is the story? Which actually reminds me of another story with Dorian. Uh, there was a time, this was several years ago, uh, about three years ago, I guess, because I was still living in San Francisco at the time, where I was at home, I was making dinner in the kitchen, and I noticed suddenly that it was quite quiet. And with three little children, when it is quiet, you think, ah, something is awry. But I looked out to our living room to see something that was actually very sweet, which is Dorian, who was two at the time, was sitting on the couch reading a book. Raise your hand if you have kids. All right, so if you have kids or you spend much time around kids, you may know, two-year-olds don't read. Right? They don't do that quite yet. But Dorian is sitting on the couch with a book open in his lap. And he's turning the pages of the book. And as he does so, he is telling himself out loud the story, which blows my mind when I step back and think about it. I bring this up here because I believe there are things we can learn from Dorian and his storytelling that we can apply to great effect when it comes to the stories we want to tell with our data as well. We'll talk about that. Before we do, I want to spend a little bit of time telling you about the book that Dorian is reading. The book is called Larry Gets Lost in Seattle. It's written by John Skews. He's written about a dozen of these where the plot, the characters, every single time, exactly the same. Right, there's a little boy, Pete, and his dog, Larry. And in each book, they go on a grand adventure to a new city. So in the Seattle book, Mom, Dad, Pete, and Larry cross the water on a ferry. Soon a city became near. The ferry boat docked beside a pier. They may have come from near Bainbridge Island, where I grew up. All right, so they go on a grand adventure to a new city. But then, inevitably, something happens. And the pair gets separated. Larry gets lost. Tension is introduced. This tension builds over the course of the book where they're each wandering the city independently, seeing some sights along the way, trying to find each other. Here they are at Pike Place Market. Larry, in the forefront there, saw some salmon passing by, not in the water, they're in the sky. He's at the fish market. And if we pause to take notice, Pete is there. He's in the background. Right, but they haven't seen each other yet. They keep having all these near misses. Tension is building. This tension reaches a point of climax when the little boy Pete wonders, will I ever see my dog Larry again? The little dog Larry wonders, will I find my boy Pete again? Dorian, at two years old, was visibly upset at this point every single time. But then inevitably, we'd see that their paths started to lead them towards each other. And finally, the pair is reunited, right? That tension that was introduced is resolved. It is a happy ending. By the way, Larry gets lost all over the United States. <laughs> he apparently has not been to Las Vegas yet. Anyway, back to Dorian, right? What makes it so he can read this story, and why is that relevant to what we're talking about today? Right? How can we use that when it comes to the data stories that we want to communicate? When I step back and think about it, primarily it is three things. Words, pictures, and story. Right? Words have to be written on the page so that when we read these books to him, his experience of them is roughly the same each time. Pictures, that's coming back to that picture power we talked about earlier, right? Where when he turns the page, he sees the picture and is reminded of what's happening in the story. And story is the most important part of all of this. There is a story. It has a shape. Right? We've already talked about words and pictures a bit, so let's talk more now about story. Stories typically follow a narrative arc. Start off, there's a plot. Some sort of tension is introduced. That tension builds in the form of a rising action. It reaches a point of climax. There's a falling action, a resolution. Right, Pete and Larry followed this story to the T. Started off plot, on their way on the ferry for a grand exploration of Seattle. But then tension is introduced when the pair gets separated. That tension builds over the course of the book. So they each wander the city independently trying to find each other. It reaches a point of climax when they wonder, will we ever find each other again? But then we start to see a falling action as their paths lead them towards each other. And finally, an ending. 
the pair is reunited, that tension that was introduced is resolved. We are hardwired to remember stories that come to us in this form. Challenge is, the typical business presentation doesn't really look like this. Right? Typical business presentation follows a more linear path. Or you might start off with a question, right? What did we set out to solve for in the first place? Then the data and analysis, right? What did we look at? Where did we get it? What assumptions did we make? What do we have to do to clean it? What were the statistical methodologies that we employed? Then our findings. What did we learn through our analysis of the data? And then finally, our recommendations. What might we do now differently given what we've learned from the data? This is pretty much what my storyboard looked like, right? This is the path that comes most naturally to us when we communicate, oftentimes, because this is the path we go through as analysts when we're analyzing data. This is a very selfish path. Because at no point in this traditional linear path do I have to give any thought to my audience. And that, for me, is the biggest shift that takes place when we move from thinking about our business presentations on a linear path to rethinking them using the shape of the arc. Let's take a look at what this might look like for my store traffic story. Let's start off with the plot. Right? Backing up, sales are driven by a couple of components, traffic and basket. Traffic's down. Uh, it's down across regions, right? This is our tension starting to interject and build. It's down especially for our super shoppers, who, by the way, are really important. Uh, basket's also down for our super shoppers. All of this means that sales are down. You decide how dramatic you want to get at that point. But all is not lost, right? The super shopper basket has some interesting things going on that actually highlight some opportunities. Items are down, but average price per item is up. We, have by the way, have been doing some luxury brand promotions that have been wildly successful. So let's do a couple of things. Let's support marketing's pilots to increase traffic, and let's do more with this luxury brand super shopper combo we've been seeing. Here, resolution is what you, audience, can do to resolve the climax, the tension that I've brought to light. And it's not about making up tension. It's about bringing the tension that's there, recognizing it, and bringing it to light. If there were no tension, you would have nothing to communicate about in the first place. But when we think about the tension, not from our perspective, but from our audience's perspective, right, what matters to them that's what we can use to get their interest and build credibility and motivate them to act. And the main point of all of this is we should do these low-tech things before we spend a ton of time in our tools. Because when we take the time to do that, we can do this. Hi, I'm Cole. I'm here from the Customer Insights team. I'm going to be talking to you today about super shoppers. And more broadly, some things that have been going on with sales and traffic and basket. We've got some ideas to talk about that we think can reverse some negative trends. So let's start by setting a bit of baseline here. Sales is made up of a couple of things. On the one hand, traffic. Right? How many people are actually coming into our stores? And the other side of sales is basket. What do they actually buy when they're with us? So let's start by looking at traffic. We'll look at basket momentarily. So 2018, at this point in the year, we had had 135 million people walk through our doors. That is a large number. This year's number, for comparison, is still large, but is smaller than last year's. Uh, we're down 4% year over year. Six million fewer customers have come to us this year versus last year. Let's take a look at how that plays out over time. So here we're going to look at store traffic over time, of course, for a calendar year, ranging from January at the left to December at the right. Notice our scale here. We're going from zero at the bottom on the y-axis to 20 million customers on our uh, top of our y-axis. So let's take a look at 2018 first. We start to see some peaks and valleys. We'll talk about those in a minute. I'm going to layer 2019 onto our graph here. Uh, let's talk about the shape of this data. 
So there are some things here that are driving what we're seeing. First off, January is when we have our annual sale. It drives a ton of people into our stores, so we see a big uptick in traffic then. In April, we run some, run some mini promotions that also have positive impact on people coming into our stores. And then finally, as you know, we run our super shopper promos in July. That brings a lot of super shoppers in and very excited to be with us. So our traffic this year lags last year, right? 2019, that line is lower than 2018. And that gap's grown in recent months. You don't see it so much here, but if we actually take a look at the year-over-year -year change, Notice we're trending right around 3% deficit this year versus last year early on in the year. But that's increased in recent months. We're up above 6% now when it comes to our year-over-year -year change. Now we took a look at this across regions. There's not a lot interesting going on there. We see a decrease everywhere. We see a decrease more in the Northeast, which makes sense. We closed a couple stores there. So we thought, okay, region's not really our story here. Let's take a look at the super shoppers and dig into them a little bit more. So this graph is similar to what we just looked at with overall traffic, but now we're looking at traffic just for our super shoppers. So notice our scales changed. We're running now on our y-axis from zero to six million customers at the top. So let's put 2018 up there first. Notice this line's a lot flatter than it was with our overall traffic. So our super, super shoppers are coming more consistently on a monthly basis. Uh, 2019 lags here as well. We'll talk about that more. Um, it's been markedly down since April, it turns out. And notice those red bars below are a lot bigger here than they were when it came to our overall traffic. With the exception of one month, right, July. Remember, that's when we run our super shopper promos. So we saw less of a decrease in July than the rest of the year, which is sort of interesting. So we've talked about traffic, right? But sales is also made up of basket, what people buy when they're in our stores, both in terms of the number of things that they purchase, as well as the average price of those things. So we thought, let's take a look more at this piece. When we look at overall basket across all of our customers, there's not much interesting going on here. When we look at our super shoppers specifically, though, there is some interesting uh, things happening there. So we're going to focus just on our super shoppers uh, when we look at basket. So let's start with the average number of items purchased. Um, so we see a pretty noisy graph over the course of the year. January, our annual sales, uh, people are buying more items. You also see peaks around back to school shopping in September, leading into the holidays at the end of the year. If I start building this year's point by point, notice we started off at a deficit where the average number of items purchased this year was lower than last year. But we've mostly caught up in the more recent months. In the last two months, we're looking pretty much the same year over year. It's a different picture, though, when we look at the average price per item. So we start building this year's on top of last year's. We started off very close, but then in April was when we first started forging partnerships with luxury brands and started using some of that in our super shopper promotions. promotions. Specifically in July was when we did a lot of that. So we see this gap forming in a positive way, right? Where this year our super shoppers are buying more expensive items than they ever have before. So in light of this data, we want to recommend a couple of things. First off, support marketing's efforts to pilot programs that are going to get more people into the stores. I think generally getting more people in is going to have positive impact on sales. And then secondly, let's look more into these luxury brand partnerships. They've been wildly successful at getting our super shoppers to spend more. So let's make another area of focus how we can get more of our super shoppers in and more of them to spend more. We think that if we do these things, we can not only reverse the negative trend we've been seeing in sales, but we still have an opportunity to make 2019 one of our best years yet. Thank you. So that was a better meeting. Right? I was able to shift the conversation entirely, where I wasn't getting questions about my data or requests for more data. Rather, I was using the data to frame a conversation, a conversation about our business and what it means, a conversation that can help us drive people to action. And I did that through applying the powers that we learned from these super kids. 
right? Avery, the super writer, taught us how we can use words to refine pictures and pictures to refine words, where as they both get stronger, they reinforce each other in really powerful ways. Also, the benefit of sketching, right? Of keeping things low tech, allowing yourself to iterate and find what's going to work for your data, for your takeaway, for your scenario. Eloise taught us the importance of asking one simple question again and again and again. Why? Right? In doing so, we can build a better understanding of our data, which then allows us to paint a more robust picture for our audience, helps us encourage them to make smarter decisions based on the data. And then finally, Dorian, our narrative ninja, taught us the power of story. Right? He recognized it has a structure. We can storyboard that structure by brainstorming, editing, getting feedback and iterating, and we can take it to a whole other level when we consider that narrative arc. And we can use story and not just show our data, but rather use these things to get our audience's attention, build our credibility, motivate them to act, so that we're not just showing our data, we are making our data a pivotal point in an overarching story. That was a lot of content in a little bit of time. If you like this stuff and want more, be sure to check out the books, Storytelling with Data, uh, which covers the foundations for communicating effectively with data. So data visualization best practices meets communication. And then I'm very excited to share with you Let's Practice, uh, which was just published last month. Uh, covers the same foundational principles, but in a much more hands-on way, where you're encouraged to undertake exercises, some of which are solved for you to get a good understanding of more examples and tips and tricks and thought process and it's fun for you to solve on your own, and others that are focused on how do you actually apply this in the workplace. And after this, I will be at the Wiley booth, which is in the data center near Alteryx, uh, signing. They do still have copies for sale. Uh, you can, of course, pick these up on Amazon as well. Something else I am very excited to share with you is the Storytelling with Data community. This is brand new. Uh, I am a strong believer that to get good in this space means practicing and getting and receiving feedback and discovering great work and talking with others about their challenges and struggles and successes. And the Storytelling with Data community has been crafted to facilitate all of these things. If that sounds interesting, check out community.storytellingwithdata.com. Use the invite code DATA19. We're in beta testing mode, but I have a feeling we might be able to let some folks out of this room into that beta testing if you feel so inclined. So definitely check that out. And with that, I say a very big thank you. <laughs>